What is the next generation of modern learners and how do we serve them? To moderate our next discussion, I'd like to introduce to you Jared Counterman. And Jared is a student advising manager here at CSU Global. In addition to advising, he has been assisting students in areas of career services and financial aid, giving him a broad view of the student experience from start to finish. With 10 years of higher education experience, Jared has passion for assisting students and helping them fulfill their educational goals. So joining us today on the panel, um, first is David Stillman. David has been researching, writing, consulting, and primarily speaking about generations for nearly 20 years. Uh, David co-authored the bestsellers, When Generations Collide, and The M Factor, How Millennials Are Rocking the Workplace. He's appeared as a generational expert on CNN, CNBC, and The Today Show, and in national publications including Time Magazine, The Washington Post, and The New York Times and USA Today. Also joining us is Jonas Stillman, who's a recent high school graduate and currently the youngest speaker on the national lecture circuit. Uh, he's already shared his insights with a variety of companies and industries, as well as contributed to stories about Gen Z, with MSNBC, CBS, and the Fast Company. Jonah and the team of peers conducted one of the first national surveys about Gen Z's attitudes towards a workplace. The eye-opening results ignited Jonah's interest in keeping the dialogue going. Also with us today is Morgan Hooker, who is currently a master's student with CSU Global pursuing her project management degree. She works full-time as a project engineering manager for Nestle's corporate team. She also has a decade of experience working in project and product engineering for companies such as Zebra Technologies, Discovery Channel, and Rolls-Royce. We also have Dr. Christy Price, professor in both the School of Liberal Arts and the School of Health, uh, Health Professions, and the founding director of the Center of Academic Excellence at Dalton State College. She has been teaching at the collegiate level for 25 years. She is a nationally recognized authority on innovative teaching techniques to engage millennial learners, chosen for the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching as the Outstanding U.S. Professor for 2012 in the Baccalaureate College category. Dr. Price's awards are, in part, as a result of her innovative uh, strategies in assisting students to achieving learning outcomes. So welcome to our panelists today. Um, Christy, we'll go ahead and start with you, um, if you can lead us off. So you're a strong advocate for adapting to millennial learners. What's the difference in how these students learn compared to students from earlier generations? Uh, well, like David and Jonah, I've been traveling the U.S. and abroad doing workshops and, you know, in business and industry and in education. And what I've been trying to convey are what I call my new R's for engaging modern learners. Just in the intro here, I want to hit on just a couple of those and say um, my main message is we can't do what, what was done unto us, basically, that we need to use my, the first our research-based methods. And so um, that means evidence-based, brain-based, um, no more information overload with lecture only, um, small segments with embedded, lots of embedded multimedia, um, active learning that's applied and problem-based, uh, which, which then leads me to my second R, if we're looking at the educational and cognitive psych literature, um, relevant it needs relevance, moving away from that old school memorization, regurgitation of facts to more transformational, significant learning experiences, um, skill development that trans environments. It's so exciting to see something like David and Jonah, where Jonah is out there getting speaking experience um, at such a young age. That sort of embedded um, active practice that, that will develop skills um, for the world of work. And then just to hit on a, um, relaxed, I think the other thing that I gathered from my data was that we need learning spaces like learning cafes and um, definitely use of instructional technology uh, having information available 24-7 to our student trainees, multi-directional where it's collaborative, interactive, applicable, and even enjoyable, um, whether it's the world of work and training associated with, um, you know, on-the-job type of training um, or in higher education um, or K-12. Appreciate you sharing with that. Um, David and Jonah, you've spoken across the country um, and around the world about generations and how they work differently. Um, what are some of the primary differences between um, Generation X, Millennials, and the, the Gen Z population? Well, first of all, we're very happy to be here, and we're incredibly excited that we could make this work. We are actually currently in 
Santiago, Chile, South America right now. We just had a presentation this morning on the future of the Gen Z workforce. And we head to Buenos Aires for another presentation tomorrow. So it's been an incredible couple of weeks and we're just happy that we can make this work. And yeah, you said it. And you know, the fact that we have an entire group of people interested in the next generation of learners says it all because people do realize that we are very different. You have a generation like mine, Gen Z, that is going to consume information at college very differently. And we've grown up in a drastically different time compared to millennials, compared to Gen Xers. So from anything from the content we learn, the way we learn and recruitment methods, we are drastically different. And I think that it's important to look at because a generation like mine that's grown up constantly with technology, we're going to be on it differently. So, you know, we constantly see these messages with recruitment advertisements, come here, learn this, but, you know, we consume differently. So I think the way that, you know, schools reach us is it's, it's changing and it's important to note that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just time to adapt and change. Um, a big difference that I would point out, we've touched on it a little bit, is I think we can look at the economic times that the generations grew up in. And if we look at millennials, it was really economic expansion. Things were exciting. They had boomer parents telling them they could be anything they wanted to be. And a lot of the boomers' um, identification was tied to their kids. So it was very important to the baby boomers that their millennial kids go to college. And it was an economic expansion, so it was an exciting time where college was really on the table. When you compare that to Jonah's generation, um, they came of age during the recent recession. And so money's top of the list. They're more in survival mode. They don't believe anything's possible. And they also did not have parents telling them they could be anything they wanted to be. They said it's a tough world out there. So they were raised very differently. And as a result, they look at higher, edu through a di higher education through a different lens. Great, thank you. That's a great point about how different generations are looking at higher education. Um, so Morgan, actually, let's go ahead and turn it over to you. So you're a working professional and also a student. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about your workplace experience um, and kind of how that intertwines with your educational goals? The, the biggest part of my journey is when I started in uh, an engineering school, um, I actually was getting an engineering degree as a blanket. I knew I just needed one to get into the field and sort of get my feet wet. I didn't know where in engineering I wanted to go, but I knew I needed to have the knowledge base that whenever pit, whatever I picked, um, I would, you know, be able to move forward and learn and grow into a role. Now, after having experience um, working for Rolls-Royce Naval Marine, I've learned that I like different design aspects. Having worked for Discovery Channel, I know I like working on tight timelines, on crazy projects. And then with, um, with Zebra, I know I liked more in the management side. Um, I like seeing the whole project come together. So now it was my role in, um, at Nestle. I look at education as a way to not only affect my immediate team and how we interact and how I run a project, um, but as, what, as a way, as a vehicle to my next part in Nestle, you know, my next role in um, in my career. It's much more specialized now. And so when I look at education and what I decide to study, it needs to be directly applicable. And that's where I think most education needs to start heading, um, especially higher education. And it isn't just anymore a, I know how to learn. It also can be a uh, a more directly usable skill. And Morgan, you talked about how your education needs to be directly applicable. And um, David and Jonah, you had mentioned how generations are looking at education differently. Um, it, it, maybe you two can lead us off in this question. Do you think uh, different generations are looking for different things within education? Yes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback off of what Morgan said, and I could not agree with her more when especially when you know that there's an entire generation, you know, questioning the best path to their pos best path to the possible success in life. Is that college? Is that taking an alternate route? What they're going to be looking for in college is classes that are specifically tangible to their future. And, you know, that's why, while you could question, and we're huge believers in liberal arts degrees, but it's harder to, for my generation to see as relevant because, you know, a lot of the requirements are classes that are so focused on the path past. You take a class like Greek civilization. While I'm not sitting here saying that's not interesting, 
it's way harder for my generation to see as relevant because you're learning about things that happened in the past. What we're looking for is tangible experiences that are going to help us get to where we want to go. So if I'm, you know, studying to be an accountant, I'm going to want to partner with an accounting firm throughout my education experience. So while I'm getting experience in the classroom, I'm also working at the same time. And we're starting to see that. We actually worked with a university, Maryville University in St. Louis, who did just that. Their accounting students partnered with a accounting firm throughout their journey. So that is exactly what is it's going to take to recruit a Gen Z student is getting those real life work experiences and not just learning in the classroom, but getting those experiences as you go along. So I could not agree with what Morgan said more. And I'll just add in our national survey, 79% of Gen Z said they're looking for their education to be experiential. So whether that be internships, whether that be guest professors from local businesses, the more they can see a direct connection, like Morgan said, between what they're learning and how it applies, the more likely they are to engage in the education. Morgan, did you want to add anything to that? I know you had kind of briefly touched on that um, during your initial answer as well, but anything to add? Yeah, well, when, you know, I'm looking at people um, that I work with, when I hire them, um, you know, the, I still look for that foundation. I think that that foundation of being able to learn is very important. But like they were saying, you know, I, um, I, having that experience, whether it's through a professor, through an internship, um, even being on a, you know, solar car team or a robotics team, something that puts you in touch with the industry, what it's really like like um, it not only is you and uh, while it might take some people a long time you know we've still got a lot of people that come in as undecided uh, you, you know you want classes that put you more in that mindset of okay if I was you know a, a, a physicist this is what my everyday life would be or if I decide to become a, a, a psychiatrist this is the kind of you know interactions I'm gonna have every day I, you want someone who can pick it all up and understand it and, and trend with it, but you also need that balance of a practical knowledge that's directly applicable and a little bit more of a instinctual, um, I know how to grow in this position. And that needs to kind of blend together into this happy marriage in your college experience, whether it's undergrad or graduate. Great. And then Christy, I don't, I think you may have uh, gotten lost there for a moment. <laughs> I've ran three stories up and I'm in a whole different location now. So <laughs> we'll see if the signal is better here. I could agree more. I mean, part of my message is, again, we can't do things the way that we've always done. We need to start, um, you know, particularly in the higher ed situation or wherever we are looking at the next step. So I think modern learners are very savvy in the sense that they're looking at their future. And so one of the things I talk to professors about is this idea that we need to look at the world of work. Here are the top 10 things that employers seek. What we're doing right now in this learning environment, whether it is liberal arts history, um, you know, I'm teaching uh, psychology related courses, you know, the idea is that Students now are looking at, well, what is, how is this, how will this be of use to me, as uh, Morgan just said, in terms of everything should be looking at what's applied and how can I use this um, for my future, basically. So sorry I missed out on some of that. I may be repetitive in what people have said here. No, we appreciate your insight. So I'm glad you were able to run up three flights right. of stairs and join us again. Um, so Jonah, I'm going to turn it back over to you. So um, you had conducted this national survey about Gen Z's attitudes towards the workplace. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight about what you and your peers learned from that um, and how that may translate into um, higher education and some of the lessons that, that we can learn? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so part of the study that we did with the Gen Z's workplace attitudes was you know, the general theory of a generation is that your outlook on the world is shaped by certain events and conditions that happen during your formative years. And one of the greatest or one of the biggest conditions that affected my generation was the 2009 recession, as my dad mentioned. And therefore, our outlook with financial resources and money is very relevant in the workplace and especially in higher education. And, you know, we were talking about when you're one of the things that we talked about um, was what are you looking for most so in the workplace? What, is the, what do you want the most? And for millennials, when they ran that study, the number one answer by far was meaning. They wanted to find meaning in the workplace. They said, if I'm going to go work you know, X amount of hours a week, I want to make sure that I'm moving the needle on something. And for my generation, totally different. 
we were very concerned about financial resources. We, had, we realized that, you know, we saw our parents struggle so much during the recession that we said that if we're going to go work X amount of hours during the week, we need to make enough money to support our families and live a nice life. And we said that doesn't mean we don't care about meaning. It says that, you know, if I have a job that can pay the bills and support my family, I'll find meaning in a host of ways. Now, also our concern and awareness of money at a young age makes college, you know, very questioning to us. We know that by far when we ask this, what is your number one fear? This is a question we asked in our second survey. 67% of my generation said their number one fear is how are they going to be able to afford college? And I think that is, should be incredible, incredibly scary to students, to the schools, because it's, it's, we're sitting here saying that if I'm going to go spend, you know, a hundred thousand dollars on an education, what is my return on investment? And it, it's scary as a student to think that you're going to be, have all those debts and need to take all those student loans out because it, we're very aware of money because of the recession and we, because we did see our parents struggle so much. So is it more the, the financial aspect of college and less of the actual um, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, the, relevant, the relevance of some of the subject matters of, you know, Greek history or things along those lines that is really the big difference for the Gen Z population as far as your, your approach and your attitude towards pursuing a higher education? It, it, it's both actually. And what you've said there is that our, our financial awareness in you know, our fear of not being able to afford it has affected our decision process. And what I mean by that is that the value proposition of college has drastically changed over the years. Now, when my dad went to college, as he applied, the message that he was constantly given by the colleges was, we have thousands of majors, this amount of minors, come discover yourself at our university. We will provide you on your journey through college. And he always jokes that his first major was forensics, oh, and forensic, and medical, and then got a degree in journalism. But that is where it is totally different with my generation, where we know that 61% of my generation feels as though they need to know exactly what they want to do before they go. Because if we're going to spend, once again, that amount, that amount of money on college, we view it as irresponsible to go bounce around for a year and not make progress towards getting that degree. And you could argue that's, you know, unfortunate. It's sad because, you know, college is supposed to be that time to discover yourself, but it's, it's too hard for us. We can't justify spending an extra thirty, forty thousand dollars to not make progress towards the finish line. So like Joan is saying now there's a new value proposition. Like you said, it used to be come discover yourself. But you're gonna and not, so most universities we work with have not changed the value proposition. Right. And so it's still come discover yourself where you're talking to a generation where sixty one percent of them already if they're going feel they already know what they want to do. So it needs to be more, hey you know what you want and we're gonna get you there quickly and efficiently. It's a much different value proposition that most haven't changed yet. Okay, so that's a big lesson that higher education can learn is tying it directly to those goals as opposed to, like Jonah had mentioned, this self-exploration discovery aspect. So okay. It's like, it's no different than trade school. That's one mm -hmm. thing that trade school has just done really well. You come, you learn, and you're out, you know, and a lot of this generation sees higher ed with a trade school mentality. I'm going to pursue a trade, and then I'm going to come out. Now, those of us who love liberal arts like me, I love it, but it's a harder sell. Got it. Awesome. Appreciate that insight. Um, and Jonah, I know that you had mentioned this a little bit earlier in uh, one of your responses, but, um, you know, everyone talks about millennials being um, digital natives and immersed in technology since, since they were born. Um, you could also say the same thing about the Gen Z population. Um, if there's an ease and fluency with technology, um, if that's one of the things that unites these generations, what are some of the differences in the ways that they use the technologies? So, um, Jonah, actually, I'll come back to you. Um, I'm curious to know what uh, Christy's perspective is, um, again, from kind of that millennial pers uh, aspect. You know, I think it's interesting. I, I have some issues with cohort research in general, which is my own research is cohort research, um, in the sense that what I like what uh, Jonah said about, well, they were impacted by 2009 and so forth. I think every generation is, there are cohort issues. What I found, though, in collecting my data, which I thought was very interesting, is that 
my non-traditional group, the what we would consider to be the at this the learners in higher education that are 25, age 25 and up, um, when I was able to get a comparison group and compare them to to our millennials, which are age 18 to 24, typically college age, um, I was more shocked by the similarities than I was by the differences. I think so. I think what's happening here is just this move toward as as what Joan is saying, this pra the practical nature. Um, you know, those older students, there were some issues when you mentioned uh, digital natives. Um, I think there is a higher percentage of reluctance in terms of technology and um, with some of the older students. But I also get a lot of feedback that, um, you know, that our younger population of students, they're selectively savvy. So in, in terms of what they're used to and what they're using and social media, and yes, they're very savvy, um, but that does not mean um, that they're necessarily familiar with every aspect of use of technology and so forth. So, so I did see, and just generalizing my data, a little more reluctance um, in the older cohort in terms of openness and comfort with technology. Um, but that is, as I say, I mean, I think part of this is not just generational, it's just that the culture has moved so rapidly toward accessing information. I referenced my own child who's actually a freshman in high school now, but you know, his entire life he has had access to information via the click of the mouse. You know, it is not like, and I love the comparisons that David and Jonah are making because it is not like their parents' generation where I did go to college for professors to provide information to me because I did not have access to that information. Now they have access to it, which makes it even more imperative that we are, um, you know, couching the information. We're using what I call educational or class time as processing time, that we're narrowing down what's relevant, what matters, how are we going to de develop skills once again for the world of work uh, associated with the technology use. So I would say technology use is always um, close to the top five, but always in the top 10 of what employers are seeking. And I think our student population is very aware of that and very focused on developing the specific skills that they might need in their particular discipline. Um, I'm just tossing out, you know, there are different technologies that are imperative to students who are going to do research in social sciences as compared to students who are in a school of business and an accounting major. I think our students are very selectively, this is the information I need to know, these are the technologies that I need to be aware of. Um, very practical, as uh, Jonah said, in terms of their selectivity and technology use. And part of that is, it's just unrealistic to be technologically savvy. And uh, we use what, uh, or we become familiar with what is of use to us, I guess we should say. Um, so I see them very practical in that sense. Morgan, what about you as far as your use of technology as a non-traditional online student? Um, what does that look like? And maybe how does that differ from any, like maybe from your work experience? I had a very traditional college experience. You know, I was at a university, I was at George Washington University. You know, I played sports, I um, went to classes, I got two different degrees, it was very much so a discovery trip. Um, but now, as I'm at Nestle, uh, you know, I not only am maybe flying every three to five days. Uh, I'm on 100% travel. I live out of hotels and corporate housing. Um, I sometimes don't even know where, what state I'm going to be in, in the next three days, five days, um, you know, uh, there's no home base. So not being able to go into a classroom, you know, it takes some adjustment. And as someone who's sort of at the back end of, I think what's considered a millennial, um, you know, I was right in that transitional period where I remember pagers and cell phones and then sort of smart phones coming into play and having laptops and internet everywhere you know, becoming the norm um, so that transition probably is a lot easier than someone maybe 10 or 15 years my senior um, for that digital online classroom experience um, as opposed to a more classical in classroom university education um, and I and I think just being able to adapt to that um, around a schedule someone not just someone who's working, you know, maybe a, a housewife with three kids, being able to adapt to that schedule um, will really make a difference in how online education progresses.
Jonah and David, what about from your perspective? How do you see the, the differences in the use of technology between the generations? I don't know. Our, our research and what I, from what I said might challenge some of the things that I've heard, actually, in the sense that you said, you know, these, the millennials are truly digital natives. When in reality, I would say that every generation pre-Gen Z are truly digital pioneers. And then my generation is the digital native generation. And what I mean by that is that a millennial, an Xer, a boomer, and traditionalist can recognize a time pre and post the technological world that we live in today. When in reality, then my generation has only to some extent known a world where our phones are smart. They're really just another computer for us and we have an innate ability to operate in this world of technology. And there's a couple things to that. Uh, one of which is when it comes to a digital pioneer like my dad, they get excited about new technology. Apple introduces Apple Watch or there's a new 3D TV or virtual reality. It's exciting to hear about where we're going and my generation, it's very hard for us to get excited about it because, you know, we just expect the next technology advancement to come along. We're well beyond accepting technology. We just truly expect it. So from a recruitment standpoint and, you know, an engagement, a lot of business leaders, schools try to dazzle my generation with technology. They say, you've got to come see this new dashboard we have, or you got to come see this new communication platform we have. When in reality, we're thinking, yeah, I mean, we just assume that you would have that because like I said, we just expect technology to be in every aspect of our lives. And another way this plays out is, especially in the higher education field, is with online degrees. And when I say this is if you go to a school that has both physical classrooms and an online school, they tend to be very separated. There's very different between the two. You're either in the classroom or you're part of their online program. And I think that this is an opportunity to get rid of the difference and bridge the two because we know that 51% of Gen Z views an online degree as the same as a traditional degree would be. So as soon as you start, you know, introducing them as one and the same, because we see no difference whether I'm in the classroom or at home from a laptop, just like we're doing this virtual right now, we're still learning and it doesn't truly matter if I'm there physically or I'm there digitally. And that's truly where that digital word plays out. We have no line between the physical and the digital world. It has not just been blurred. It truly has been eliminated. And there's, we live in the physical and digital worlds at all times. Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, like Jonah mentioned, when we go, when we get brought into a university and they'll be talking about curriculum and whether it's experiential, et cetera, one of us will say, you know, what about your online offering? Like, oh, that's a completely different department, a different group. And that's where we think the rub is. It should be one and the same. If I log on or I show up, I should just completely feel like I'm getting the exact same experience. And too often we find they're separate experiences. The other thing I think technology plays in, and as someone touched on it earlier, is access. I mean, if Jonah wants to know something, he logs onto YouTube, looks it up and watches and learns. And he learned and they can get right back at it. So this is a generation, we find that they're, the way they approach learning is you learn as you go. So you step into a situation, if you don't know what to do, you stop, learn what you need, then get back to work. So they learn as they go. And this is haunting corporations now that are putting all their employees in one classroom, learning at the same pace and in the same space. And so this generation is a little bit more customized, wants to be able to just learn what they don't know and then move on. I wanted to add to this and that I think sometimes the larger the university, the more separate those two processes are. But um, so I'm, I'm really pleased with some of the smaller places that are, you know, because of the lack of resources, they don't have those two tracks. So they sort of go together. But I, what I will say is, in my experience, um, even the face to face um, classroom experience has been revolutionized by technology. So we are, we are strongly hybridizing things, um, which basically means it's half online, it's half in the classroom, which I think is a nice compromise. And then um, we are also flipping the classroom a lot, which means much of the content goes online. So I think I love what Jonah said about the expectation, because now I think the expectation of our learners is once again, that 24 seven, it's available to me, um, lots of the assessments are online and you can go on at midnight and take your test if you want to um, all the material and and the other thing I would add you know so it's all up there and available um, so that way learners like Morgan you know they have the opportunity to access the information from their hotel room at any time um, but also I would add this about in the cognitive psych literature the one thing that I did think was overwhelming that I'm always saying as I travel and, and speak to educators and professionals and trainers and that is 
multimedia, what, what um, Jonah said about multimedia, you know, my own child watches videos of people playing video games. Uh, that's the, <laughs> this is a, a, a revolution. There's been a revolution in this multimedia. And when you look at the literature, and I may offend some who are old school and have looked at this whole idea of auditory. Some people are more auditory. Some people are more kinesthetic. Um, some are more visual. I mean, if, if you look at the newer literature in cognitive psych, everyone, particularly this new generation, very visual. So I will have students see me, you know, years after a course and say they remembered videos um, just very clearly uh, two years after. So this, this idea of learning, and I mean, it's, it, once again, I don't think it's just generational. You know, we look at the culture and the culture is very, oh, you got a DIY project, Google it and watch the video. You want a new recipe, Google it, watch the video. So it is not unique to Gen Z, I don't think, but it is certainly much more necessary uh, because that is what they're used to. If we want to be effective at what we're doing in terms of training and in terms of teaching in higher ed, we have to account for that visual piece. So I have um, in my workshops and my teaching constant embedded video, constant embedded video, and then processing and discussion of that video. But um, the, the visual is really highly critical for this generation. Great. I appreciate everybody's insight into those questions. Um, Want to take some time and allow our audience members to also ask a couple questions of the panel. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to the audience for those questions at this point. Thank you, Jared. And thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts on this panel so far. The first question just comes, I think for more for all of you, but um, all of you said basically generations consume information differently. Can you give us some specific examples how your generation consumes information? Jonah, you wanna go ahead and start with that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. I'd say that quite simply, the simplest answer is my generation has truly been trained or you know, grown up in a time where we've learned everything in sound bites. Everything has been condensed, everything has been shortened and we learn quickly. I mean, it, it plays out the way we learn, the way we're entertained with programs that were so popular like Vine. I mean, you could, you could become insanely famous and insanely popular through a six second video and that is all it took. I mean, and then you talk about having an eight second attention span. Everything has just been processed faster, faster, faster. And truly, I think when it comes to learning, the quicker you can get a point across and then have that Gen Zer allow them to take it in, into themselves and let them spin it off on their own way, truly is the shorter the better, especially with the generation that has such a short attention span and has always been able to and encouraged to learn, think, and act in sound bites. So what that means a lot of times that we find is that people have to take what used to be a very big curriculum and break it down into little chunks. And those that really are successful are the ones that break it down into a chunk, learn, and then apply it. So let me learn something, let me try it. Learn, try, learn, try, versus just here's a bunch of information hurtling at you for hours and hours. That doesn't work as much with this generation. Sound bites and then applicable. And then Morgan, what about from your perspective? I think you said you identify with maybe the, the tail end of the uh, millennial generation. It's a little bit of a, of a mixed bag because I still, you know, especially well, specifically for my profession, it's still a lot of uh, in classroom learning and on the job learning um, that isn't broken down yet into visual, um, but it's sort of coming there. And one of the things that I've really noticed in my profession um, is that even though maybe engineering is still more on the technical side and there's not as many of those um, sort of a, a breakdown of information, we are required as engineers to provide breakdowns of information to people who aren't technical and you can't to do it in long e emails or explanations. You have to do it in sound points, bullet points, short presentations with lots of video, audio content. It's becoming the, the norm uh, for, for big business to accept information in small chunks. And then if they want more information, they can dig deeper and you give them the access to do that. But, um, but it, it seems to be trending towards, you know, just keep it simple, stupid is what I was sort of always toting is uh, you keep it short, sweet, to the point, and you keep it at a level that pretty much anyone can understand. And that's all people really can handle most of the time. And then if they need more, they can go after it themselves. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people who 
oh, I don't know this bit of information. Let me go Google it. And sometimes they won't even click on the link. They'll just read the little byline and get enough information. You're like, oh, I get it. And then that's all they really have time for with learning. So, you know, it's, it's changing the way people do business, a more versatile and a quick to respond workforce. Great. And Christy, I know you can, uh, you, you already touched on this a little bit, but anything that you want to add? No, in fact, those, that's exactly what I was going to say, that we've had to move to, you know, what people had been recording their lectures and putting their full hour lectures up online for students. And it's just, it's just horrific um, in terms of educational practice. And so everything that we're seeing and flipping the classroom, putting things on, you know, five to seven minute video tops, followed by processing and questions, or as you said, the, the training model that's used in the business environment is what I think we really need to move to, where you have a set of training objectives. Everything needs to be very directed in terms of, here's what I need to know. So I, I work with a lot of old school professors who say, oh, I don't, it's, it's molly coddling or it's hand holding to tell students what they need to know. I say, no, you know, you put out, if there's a 10 minute mini lecture, you put out here are the outcomes that you need to learn from this mini lecture you know here are the outcomes that you need to learn from this five minute here are the questions that you need to answer everything very applicable um, applied directed um, once again because everybody's it's very time focused you know if everyone's making choices based on how much time they have and um, I, I think that snippet the term snippet bullet points um, I've, I've moved away from traditional textbooks in general, like from traditional textbook, <laughs> you know, realizing that there's condensed versions now, there's question and answer format in most textbooks, um, there's built in application questions that are immediate, you don't just wait to the end of the chapter to ask those questions, you know, this is starting in K-12 and has moved into higher ed as well. We have brief, brief readings brief video, brief lecture, um, everything very short um, for attention span purposes. And it's just the reality of our situation. I know that's upsetting to a lot of people. Um, I, I, myself, as a, as a Gen Xer, I love learning from TED Talks, just an auditory, but even the best TED Talks have good visual. Um, they, usually, I don't think TED Talks go more than 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, they're, even, the, um, even the previous generations of learners uh, Gen Xers, boomers, um, they're moving to this very practical, we learn based on short video on our phones and so forth too. So once again, I think it's a lot more cultural, um, the cultural cohort as opposed to just generational. But I, I do agree with everything everyone has said. Um, I think it's even more important for the millennial and Gen Z populations because they just, as, as Joan said, they just expect that. So um, they're frustrated when those needs aren't met. <laughs> Great, thank you. So our next question is kind of tied to some of the stuff you were just talking about, Christy, but um, it's this idea that we've already kind of assumed the, multi the different generations learn differently. So how can institutions adapt to that and meet uh, those desperate needs of students from multiple generations that may be in the same class together as non-traditional learners? Christy, I'll go ahead and uh, let you take that one since you're actually in the classroom. I mean, my simple answer is everything has to be multimodal. You know, we have to, we do have to address, um, and in terms of summarizing my research, you know, the most important thing that came across in terms of learning environments was that these learning environments for new and modern learners be, um, have variety that you no longer can we just lecture only for an hour and 15 minutes, you know, that we are breaking things up. So brain-based learning suggests attention span is short. We're going to do, like I said, a five minute video, a five minute lecture. We're gonna stop and process and do some team-based application. Um, everything moving toward uh, real world application, authentic. So uh, going out and doing community service projects, uh, so service learning, um, research projects, all of this out into the real environment with applied projects um, as opposed to just the traditional classroom experience that, um, as it sounded like, Morgan had <laughs> experienced in her undergrad, definitely David had experienced, and, and what I had experienced as well, um, that we, if it's multimodal, it meets everyone's needs. And I would say, too, I think the biggest resistance I get from the traditional population of professors is Try, feeling like they're giving out too much information. I say, no, you know, there's nothing bad about 
putting out, um, you know, not wasting time lecture, doing a 10 point lecture. Here's the 10 points on the learning management system. They're available to you. We're gonna spend the class time, not me lecturing about those 10 points, but we're gonna watch some video and do some activities to make sure we're applying um, these concepts as opposed to just um, classroom time as dissemination time. And that goes when I say classroom time, that's true for online learning as well. As I said earlier, um, the online learning environment should not be a, a talking head type environment where for an hour you're just listening to um, a professor's lecture like you would in a classroom, traditional classroom. Great, thank you. Our next question is directed specifically at Jonah, but you know anyone's welcome to answer as well. Um, do you see yourself ever attending an online university that uses kind of classic text-based learning management systems? You know, kind of, and they use examples of without live lectures through video conferencing, et cetera. Would you find that boring and not attractive in some way? Um, I'm gonna answer that question. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's whether or not I'll go to an online university or a traditional university. I think it's whether or not to be honest, I'll go at all. Because like I said, we see no difference. I think the question is, you know, if I go, I, I, right now I have no preference on whether I go physically there or I study from home on online. It's more so in general for my path do I specifically see higher education as part of my journey. And to be honest right now, I'm, I, I, I always joke and I say that I'm part of right now an indefinite gap year. I have yet to decide for sure if I'll go next year, if I'll go in two years, or like I said, if I'll go at all because um, I've had the opportunity at, uh, now at 18 to pilot, pioneer a dialogue regarding Gen Z studies in the workplace or on the marketplace and opportunities keep coming up. And from what I've heard and what I, when I talk to business leaders around the world is, is it worth it to me specifically because I'm doing something that I want to do right now. And until I see a direct need for a degree to advance to the next level in this career, it may not be my path right away, but to answer your question specifically, uh, if I were to go to college, I would have no problem going to a online degree. I'd have no problem going to a traditional school. To me, uh, it's whether or not I'll go at all, but I think mo like most Gen Zers, we see no difference between learning in person or in the classroom. Looking things up on YouTube is just kind of a way that, you know, your generation, uh, you know, describes learning. And I, I think it's tough for you to speak for your entire generation. But with that said, you know, do you think that that replaces higher education then? Or is there a distinction still between quality curated learning and things you can find publicly available through MOOCs? Absolutely. I heard you mention briefly that it's, you know, speaking on behalf of everyone, and I'm in no way trying to put anyone in a box here. Obviously, there's somebody going to say that I hate online degrees and I would never do one, or I only like online degrees. You know, I'm just here to say that, you know, I get that pushback a lot being 18. I think it's important to note that you run a greater risk of not identifying traits at all and trends. But uh, to be honest with you, I see YouTube as an extension, not an either or. I think that when you have a generation that's grown up with a platform like YouTube, if you've seen, if you've looked at the trajectory of what, let's just, I love talking about YouTube actually. If you've seen what we've done with the trajectory of YouTube, the possibilities are truly endless. It used to be a platform where truly you'd get a link from a distant cousin of a cat playing the piano. And now it's a platform that is no longer competing with other websites. It's computer competing with the NBCs, the Disney channels of the world. It's truly a mogul. They get 1 billion unique viewers a day. The average session of a 15 to 18 year old is 48 minutes. So it's not just one video, it's, it's a place where we go to either get entertainment or to learn. And I think there is, it's more of the, the guide on the side method where, you know, I, if I need to learn something and then take that and go right with it, 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 there's no problem with that. And you can learn anything from literally tiling a bathroom floor to speaking a new language on YouTube. So I might be studying finance in college, but have a, an intense interest in learning Swahili. And that's truly where a Gen Zer will use a platform like YouTube to extend and grow upon what they're learning, but I do not see it as a way to replace somebody that is truly interested in getting a higher education degree. I just see it as more of an extension. Okay. Anyone else have anything to add before I go on to the next? I see Chrissy yes. looks excited I, about something, what I, I said. I, <laughs> yes, I just love this kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this young man, forgive me, because I mean, I see him, I'm in higher ed, and I probably would not advise him to go, if he were my child, I wouldn't necessarily, his dad's upset with me. But let me just say, you're, I think you're an outlier, Jonah, in that, you know, you're kind of like the kid who can go straight from high school to the NBA. 
you know, you're, you're not typical. You're already on the speaking circuit. You don't, you, you don't necessarily need a degree at this point in time to continue doing what you're doing and do it successfully. So why? But he does, he does bring us back to this main point of if it's not practical, why would I? So I read over and over again in my service, you know, my, my math professor signs these problems, but he doesn't collect them for grades. So I don't do, I can, I can be successful by reading the book and not go to class. So why go to class? Or I could go to class and not buy the book and not read it and be successful. So why buy the book? You know, it's all very practical. And I see he's the perfect example of that. Um, what I will say that I think is neat um, in relation to all of this is, and my, one of my questions and my findings, I was asking about ideal assessments and ideal learning environments. But the other big question I asked that might be helpful to our audience and our viewers is about ideal, and something he said sparked this in my mind, and it was about ideal educators, you know, the quality of qualities of ideal educators, those of us who are trying to develop um, this next generation. Um, so people are in training, facilitating, people are teaching. And what's interesting is all of the qualities that we're looking for had really nothing to do with knowledge of content or subject area or anything. It was all about how we almost, as he said, guide on the side, you know, that they have access to the information, so they view us as the mentor. So what, what I gained from my own research was a movement back for this generation particularly because they are so relational. And I realized it was because the boomers, like, um, I don't know, uh, David may be a boomer. Um, the idea is that they were raised in an authoritarian way where they, they had respect for authority for authority's sake. And now we've moved to this authoritative parenting. So so young people like Jonah have been raised always with a rationale, you know, do this because it's in your best interest, because I care about your future and so forth. So they come into an educational environment expecting not only the professors and the educators and the inst even the institution to have that same philosophy, you know, that we should do this so we care. So uh, one of the best analogies I heard is Joseph Campbell's um, hero's journey. You know, we should be looking at this generation as going through Campbell's um, hero's journey, sort of like uh, Luke Skywalker. Everybody knows that reference, right? And that, um, you know, we are Yoda. We are the supportive, encouraging, help them get over the barriers. You know, the hero's journey is about they're trying to accomplish a goal and there are barriers. And my biggest message to my colleagues and to those in higher education, and maybe David and Jonah have seen a lot of this institutionally, is we as the educator, we as the institution, instead of being Yoda, we, we are the actual barrier. <laughs> you know, we are the obstacle. And so I think it's really important for us to step back and see, okay, what is it that our learners need? What are we doing that's facilitating them achieving their goals? What's the best way we can do this? Um, and then in some cases, how are we standing in their way? Great. We are pretty much at time, but I'm gonna sneak one more question in here before we move on to the networking portion. Um, pretty much every panel has kind of touched on the relationship between student and the university changing and specifically what they seek for the university as far as information versus practicality. So um, Caitlin here wants to hear more about how you see that relationship changing between students and faculty, especially with faculty playing a different role now and no longer advising the way they used to or traditionally have it in higher ed. I sort of just address that, that we, and I, I love the terminology that Joan is using is that we move more to guide on the side. So we've seen this movement and even uh, math and other, uh, the flipped classroom, the Emporium model, we're not the lecturer, we're not the disseminator of information. We do become the guide on the side. We create uh, educational environments and opportunities as opposed to just being disseminators of information. But I think once again, we have to step back and look at, well, how are we as an institution? How are we in, as individuals? Um, and in my workshops and so forth, I have lots of checklists, you know, how are we standing in the way? How are we making it difficult? Um, all of our walking around campus, all these different steps and processes that could be simplified and put online and so forth. Um, and the same is true of our classroom practices. You know, what are we doing where we're, we're streamlining things to help students be successful to achieve the goals as opposed to standing in their way? And Morgan, you want to add your insight as far as kind of your, um, what you have, uh, what you expect from a faculty member as far as that um, facilitation into the workplace? 
Sure. Um, you know, I've noticed that, uh, especially with online education um, and with traditional schooling too, it's sort of what you want to get out of it. How much you interact with your professor is sort of up to you. And maybe that's changing. So maybe before, you know, you would go to office hours to get that extra knowledge or understand a little bit of the problem, but maybe um, the role of the teacher is turning more into um, that guide that, um, that Christy was talking about. And now when I reach out to my professors, I want to know um, a little bit more than just straight knowledge. You know, maybe I want to know about their experience and how, um, or, or how, they, um, how they would tackle it so that I can see a different perspective. Um, the, the whole idea of the guides and how they're not disseminating information so much as guiding you to your own answers is great. But at the end of the day, um, I need to be able to step back and approach a problem where I don't have access to YouTube, there's no previous knowledge on it, um, and be able to figure it out for myself. How do we give students that ability? That's really the goal. I mean, uh, you know, Jonas is already on that path. He's figured out how to get what he wants or to his goal without having someone lead him or handhold him. And that's really what education's becoming. And that's what we need to get out of it from your, your, your school, your higher education, or not your higher education in some cases. <laughs> <laughs>